Hello, podcast listeners. If you've listened to us before, this might be the moment when you're expecting me to say something like, Hello, and welcome to Materials Unlocked, the podcast where we take a look at the lesser known subject of material science and try to unlock its mysteries. However, on this episode, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Uh, Hopefully the reason why will become clear very shortly. So I don't think I'll hold up things anymore. Cue the music. Hello, and welcome to Materials Unlocked, the podcast where we take a look at the lesser known subject of material science and try to unlock its mysteries. As you might have noticed, my name is not Dr. Lewis Owen. I am Dr. Cathy Christophadou, a senior lecturer in metallurgy at the University of Sheffield. In each episode, with the help of some students, friends and colleagues, we're going to delve into a particular topic and hopefully unlock its potential. This week, we're going to be talking about materials characterization. As always, I'm joined on this voyage of discovery with some of our current students. This week, it is my great pleasure to introduce Fran Sinat. Welcome to the podcast, Fran. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So, Fran, you've been a student at the university for a little while, but for our listeners, would you like to tell us what you're doing and what year you're currently in? Yep. So, um, I'm a fourth year PhD student. I'm in the Advanced Metallic System CDT, and I'm also in the Modern Alchemy Research Group, and Kathy's my supervisor. And uh, my project, I'm looking at um, oxidation of nickel superalloys for um, turbine disc applications. That's wonderful. Thanks, Fran. So, as you mentioned, I am your supervisor, so I know a little bit about your background and how you've managed to find us here. Um, But it'll be really interesting to also tell our listeners a little bit about how you ended up in material science in the first place um, and your journey finding the materials uh, Mm. CDT. Um, So my background is in physics. So I did my undergrad in applied physics and I did my master's in, it was called key enabling technologies, but it was kind of like physics with advanced manufacturing. And um, I wanted to get a bit more hands-on experience. So I was looking at PhDs online and I came across my project with you. And I just thought it was a really good opportunity to get hands-on experience. And I thought materials was really interesting because I did a lot of, like, uh, I did properties of materials in undergrad and solid state physics. So I did quite a bit on, like, diffraction. And I thought it would be a really good opportunity to take that theory and apply it into more experimental-based Fantastic. Thanks. You're queuing us right up there, Fran. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> so um, our topic this week is exactly that, materials characterization. And you've mentioned diffraction there for a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit how your research in particular is linked to materials characterization? With my, really the material I look uh, look at in my PhD, it's used in high temperature applications. And so sometimes it's really good to, um, we can like have in situ experiments so we can put our samples like in like furnaces at high temperatures and we can use things like diffraction to see how this material will behave and it's really good as well as like a non-destructive technique sometimes um some of these materials can be really expensive to break but you can really get a good insight into your materials properties fantastic and we do love breaking stuff Mm -hmm. Um, so we we'll come back to that in a little bit um so this week Fran and I are also joined by Dr. Lewis Owen, who we know and love already. (laughs) So Lewis is, of course, the host of this podcast ordinarily, but today we thought we'll do things a little differently and actually put him on the hot seat for a little bit. So Lewis is a lecturer in metallurgy characterization here at the University of uh, Sheffield. So welcome, Lewis, and thank you for joining us and letting us interview you for a little bit. Thanks, Cathy. This is so strange. <laughs> I, can't, I can't quite take this seriously. It's very unusual. As you say, it's, it, it, it's odd to, to, to be sitting in the hot seat. I'm not sure, I'm not sure which I prefer. Well, well, we'll find out. We'll find out over the course of the episode. But... I think you'll be a natural either. Well, let's know. see. Let's see. <laughs> so... Lewis, I wonder if you wanted to start a little bit and tell us about your current role within the university, being a lecturer in metallurgy characterization, and also in your role as the co-lead of the X-ray lab here. Yeah, as you've said in the introduction, uh, I'm a lecturer in metallurgy characterization. I think when we introduced you before, Cathy, a couple of episodes ago as a a senior lecturer in metallurgy. And since then, we've been talking quite a lot about metallurgy. So hopefully the metallurgy part um, is quite familiar to people. The characterization part is is what we're going to hopefully talk um, a bit more about today. And really, it's the sort of 
the study of the structures within the material and the study of those structures at sort of different length scales and how we go about actually looking at what's going on in the material at different length scales and then linking that ultimately to the properties. Because normally if we can understand the structure of something, we can begin to understand the properties it has and the link between the two. Often you'll hear people talk about structure, property uh, relationships. So characterization is really where we're we're looking at uh, the techniques that we use to actually study the material at these sort of different length scales. And there are a huge variety um, of different techniques that we can talk about, all of which have different purposes, different benefits, different drawbacks, some of which Fran has already mentioned. Uh, she mentioned uh, X-ray diffraction. And in your introduction, you mentioned that I'm uh, one of the, uh, the academic co-leads of the X-ray lab. So um, in that role, we have uh, an X-ray lab upstairs and... I think most people will probably be familiar with x-rays from a hospital where you go in and, you know, if you've broken your bone, um, you'll be shining an x-ray sort of through part of the body in order to create an image. And that is a type of characterization, but actually it's not the type of characterization we tend to do here in the x-ray lab. Uh, we tend to look at, uh, at something slightly different with those x-rays. But we can get into that in more detail. But yes, for the moment, uh, yeah, characterization, as I say, is looking at those, uh, the material at those sort of different length scales to understand its, its structure and then its properties. Fantastic. Thanks for that introduction, Lewis. I'm sure there's going to be a lot to talk about over the next few minutes. Uh, but before we get into that nitty gritty of characterization details, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your journey into material science. I think you've mentioned this previously, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you've also not had a straightforward a journey into discovering material science and engineering. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. I mean, I've always, I was always a, a sort of a, a sciencey child, I would say. I've be, always been interested in science uh, all the way through, as well as my sort of other, um, other hobbies and things. But I was always sort of interested in very often the sort of the bounds between subjects, not just chemistry or physics, but sort of where they tend to meet in sort of physical chemistry. And very often when I think of the sciences, I often think of, you know, at school you've got physics and chemistry and biology and, and, and they, they sort of never meet. They're, they're very much sort of kept, uh, kept distinct and apart. But actually there's a, there's a huge realm sort of in between where the, where the subjects overlap with one another. So physical chemistry is probably the one that a lot of people are most familiar with, which is as sort of science subjects goes a relatively old one, you know, a couple of hundred years old. And then uh, more recently, sort of, you know, um, 50 to 100 years ago, people started looking at biochemistry and things on sort of that boundary. And now actually there's a huge amount of work, very interesting work going on on the sort of biological physics boundary where people look at things like folding of proteins and uh, the surfaces of biological um, uh, materials. So I've always been interested in sort of the bounds between uh, different subjects. But chemistry was my sort of first and, and primary uh, love. But then when I came to university, I thought, well, actually, I want something that still allows me to do that sort of overlap between subjects. So I went and I studied a degree that's called natural sciences, where actually in my first year I studied a mixture of sciences. I did physics, chemistry, geology and maths. And then after that, you gradually narrow down. So then in my second year, I did chemistry and geology. And then finally, I specialized on chemistry. But actually, all the way through, um, I've always been interested in techniques. Techniques have always been the thing that's interested me. So the experimental techniques that we use to analyze materials and gain that understanding of particular chemical molecules or materials or whatever it is. And so even when I was at school, I worked as a, um, uh, a chemical ink manufacturer during Ooh. the holidays where uh, I worked with their characterization team doing some techniques like gas chromatography, mass spectrometry and NMR, which again, we can talk more so in. So many more big words. So many big words. Um, and yeah, so even as a kid, I was interested in looking at these, these sort of techniques. And so when I was then going from my degree level to my PhD, I was still interested in techniques and so actually I switched from chemistry to materials and the PhD that I was doing 
was looking at how we can apply some techniques which are quite commonly used in uh, chemistry and had been this very specific technique that I was using had been much more used in the, the chemistry systems and applying those to the f uh, for the first time to metallic systems. And so I made this sort of, you know, cross over the bound from chemistry into materials. But I mean, really, I, the, the, the divisions between these subjects are, you know, quite, they're very close and they're quite arbitrary, right? Absolutely. I mean, we all know people who work on like batteries and they might be working in a chemistry department or in a physics department or in a materials department or chemical engineering chemical engineering, mechanical engineering all sorts yeah, yeah so it's it, it as you get sort of further through the the bounds of the subjects tend to come through but yeah so eventually i've ended up sort of uh in in materials at the end but always with that that you saw the light i saw the light <laughs> i saw the light but uh, as i say always with that that characterization and, and technique purpose so i sometimes say i'm a little more materials agnostic in some way i'm happy to look at like lots of different materials i my primary focus is metals but i do also look at some other systems as well because uh, what really gets me excited uh, uh, are the characterization techniques that we use contain so. some excitement please I was going so to say, that I, we I can need to, uh, need to, talk about the techniques in a little bit I was more detail say, i've already had some tea this is you know <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm already too excited to have tea and sugar this morning and you're getting me going on my specialist subject yeah. so um, <laughs> no, that's what we like to hear but i think what struck me out of that is that transition and i think mm. characterization does unite a lot of the sciences fran here started from physics and she's found her way into materials mm -hmm. because of characterization techniques you started in chemistry. I'm a metallurgist by background, so yep. one of the few people that actually did the subject at undergraduate <laughs> level. I think one of only five people in our entire department, actually. Um, so it is really interesting looking at characterization from all of these um, different lenses, as you mentioned, Lewis. So I wondered if it's now the time to start thinking a little bit about um, and explaining some of these characterization techniques. You mentioned the lens scales already. Mm. Can you talk us through a little bit about the lens scales so that we can construct a little bit of a visual for our listeners? Yeah, so I think often at school, when you're studying chemistry, for example, there's a lot of emphasis and a lot of understanding looking at the sort of chemical structure of these things, and rightly so, looking at how the atoms bond together and thinking about, um, you know, people might have seen a diagram for the chemical structure of something like caffeine or alcohol or, yeah, I was going to say, or lo lots of different examples. And very often that's where we need to begin. We need to begin right down on that atomic scale and think about how the atoms actually go together. So atoms are the building blocks of the universe around us. Everything around us is made up of atoms. And just to give us an idea of length scales, so an atom is normally on the length scale of about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So what that means is if I took 10 billion atoms and lined them up next to each other, that would be about a meter's length. So 10 billion atoms. So that's a one with, with 10 zeros uh, after it. So these are, these are really, really small. And that, I mean, that in itself always blows my mind, the fact that what's going on on that scale, on something so small, actually affects the properties of, of everything that we, that we see around we us. The, the, you know, the interactions that we have uh, with our environment, all the chemistry and everything that goes on um, is controlled by what's going r on right down at that, that tiny length scale. Yeah, it is. And uh, being Greek, I need to come in. Oh, also, yes, yes. And yes. also tell you where the word atom comes from, which it is, of course, a Greek word. Yeah. Um, it comes from the A that means can't divide anymore. Um, and domi, we can't cut it down anymore. So the ancient Greeks believed that atoms were the smallest block yeah. of matter at the time. Of course, now we know that they're not necessarily, mm -hmm. but we still rely a lot on our understanding of um, how atoms arrange themselves in different ways um, to build up the properties of particular materials. But that, I, 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 in itself, I find, uh, I find so fascinating because one of the things, again, you know, I, I find amazing is uh, atomic theory is the sort of the, the basis of most of what we do. In fact, Richard Feynman, 
opened Richard Feynman is very famous Nobel Prize winning physicist and wrote what is possibly the greatest uh, series of physics lectures. Have you come across these, Van? I, I assume they, in, in my mind, every physics student must have picked up a copy of like Feynman's lectures at some point. But Yeah, I think our lecturers probably went through a few of them with us. I do have a book, I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 My A-level physics teacher gave me when I went to uni. Oh, that's yeah. such a nice it's gift. Lovely. That's a really nice gift. But they're, they're absolutely fantastic. And Feynman was sort of known for, for education and physics education as well as, you know, yeah. his Nobel Prize work. But he begins his very first lecture by saying, if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one piece of information passed on to the next generation of sentient beings, what piece of information would you like to pass on which would give the most information in in the fewest number of words so that you can rebuild science? Um, And his argument is atomic theory, that everything is made up of atoms. Because he says from that, you can get to physics, you get to chemistry, from physics and chemistry, you can then build to biology through biochemistry and things. And then you can construct the entirety of sort of scientific understanding. But that, that breakthrough, we sort of take for granted that everything is made up of atoms. But the idea that someone sat down and sort of came up with this idea that everything is made up of these tiny indivisible things. And atomic theory has been known about for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was really only at the turn of the 20th century, around that time, that actually we got the first bit of scientific evidence that proved that it was actually all right. And, you know, we we had all of our scientific understanding was based on this this fundamental theory. And I just find it, I Mm -hmm. I just find it it, it fascinating from a sort of history of science point of view um, as things sort of developed. Um, anyway, I've, I've already <laughs> digressed. Um, so we were, we were talking right, about... We love uh, a digression. We, we, were, we were talking about <laughs> atoms. And so, yeah, understanding things at that uh, atomic scale and how important it is to understand things on that atomic scale. And then... The thing is that actually, as we say, that scale is is quite a long way away from where we see macroscopic objects on the everyday. And one of the things in material science is that we need to understand basically everything on the length scale between that atomic scale and what we see in an everyday object. And particularly with metallurgy, one of the things that I found coming into metallurgy, um, as I say, when I came into my PhD, and started doing metallurgy for the first time, is there was a lot of talk about this thing called microstructure. And this was something that I'd never... I was going to say, metallurgy, metallurgists want to, want to talk about microstructure <laughs> all the time. Um, and it, it was one of the things that I'd not really come across as a chemist. And so this is thinking about things on the, the micron scale. So a micron is 10 to the minus 6 metres. So this is a millionth of a metre now. So imagine a million objects lined up making a, a metre. So a millionth of a metre. And so... When we're thinking about our atoms, our atoms very often stack together to make some sort of structure. Um, And these tend to be crystals and crystal structures, and we can talk more about that. But they're like little Lego building blocks that you have these crystals. And you might have seen crystals sort of in nature. You might have seen salt crystals or beautiful big like quartz crystals in geological samples. But on the microstructure scale, what we're thinking about is how those crystals then fit together. So it's a bit like having lots of different Lego blocks of different shapes and sizes. And depending on what Lego blocks you put together, you could make a different overall structure and also have different properties of that. If I make my Lego tower full of like single squares of Lego, it might break in a very different way to if I made it out of the long bars of Lego, for example. So the, the way it might snap if I dropped it on the floor or if I was trying to break my Lego model, God forbid. Mm-hmm. Um, normally it's a trip and fall and break your Lego and then disaster. It, it will change the properties on, on that length scale as well. So very often we need to understand things on that length scale too, on the microstructural scale. And then we go up a step again and we'll get to the macroscopic object so where we're seeing something 
that you know we can see or hold so something on the scale of millimeters centimeters or even meters um, uh, it could be and again we need to understand and characterize and look at what the structure looks like at that scale and understand how the properties affect it at, at that length scale as well so really we're thinking about all of these different length scales in materials and depending on what length scale we're going to look at we're going to need different techniques in order to look at and investigate what's going on um, uh, at the different length scales. That's great. That's great. And this is really important to us as metallurgists, as material scientists. We need to understand that hierarchical structure from mm. the macro all the way down to the atomic. So building on that then, let's talk a little bit about these different techniques. And yeah. maybe we can start from the macro scale, the things that most people can relate to and see in the first place. So what techniques do we have to look at the, the macro scale? Yeah, so, um, well, one of them that we've already sort of uh, referred to is let's, let, let's, let's have a talk about x-rays because I always like mm -hmm. talking about x-rays. But, but one of the, the techniques that we might use um, are things like x-ray CT, as it's called, computed demography. So this is basically like an x-ray that you would have in a hospital. You take an object, you shine x-rays through it, and you get what's like a shadow pattern on the wall and then from that you can reconstruct what the object looks like so imagine i've created a part so i've created i don't know an, an object for a turbine engine let's say we like talking about turbine engines we do indeed and let's say i've got a, a metal part but in that metal part i've put in a load of channels going through it so i can put air or some sort of coolant um through the system or I've removed material in order to make it make the overall object much lighter. And now I need to understand that material and how it's going, or that object and the material and how the overall thing is going to deform. So I'm really going to need a good understanding of the structure at that scale. So by passing x rays through it and creating this sort of shadow pattern, as you say, we can look within that structure and see what's going on and understand the shape of that structure, the geometry of that structure, and then start to think about how the material might be affected by being put into that structure. Because different materials, you know, depending on the shape that you make them in on the macroscopic scale, might have better or worse properties they could like you know it could lead to a point where you have more deformation occurring or less deformation depending on uh, exactly uh, what's taking place so yeah you can do things like that to to look at the sort of internal structure of these microscopic things take an x-ray of your object yeah in in simple terms then exactly. so why do different materials interact differently with x-rays so that mm. we can see that those structures then in the first place yeah so in 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 this case it's it's quite simple in that essentially it's due to the amount that the x-rays are absorbed in the system so as an x-ray or a beam of x-rays passes through something some of the energy will be sort of dissipated and passed on to the material and some of the x-rays will will go straight through and so basically depending on what the material is some materials are highly absorbing you might have heard you know very often people talk about lead shielding if you're in a hospital very often having an x-ray taken they'll put lead sort of around the area um, that they want to, to take the image of because the lead will prevent the x-rays going through. Whereas our bodies, for example, if we're thinking about an x-ray through our bodies, don't absorb x-rays as much. But there'll be a difference based on the materials and the materials properties between like the bone and the flesh and how much they absorb those x-rays going through, which allows us to see this sort of this graded difference um, in, in the materials and therefore in the, in the, the, the image that we observe. That's really cool. So I'm sure we'll come back to, to x-rays in a little while. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> but we now have an idea on how to look at the macro scale. How would we start looking at the micro scale? Mm. Fran, this is something you've also looked at quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Do you do you want to kick off there for a little bit and tell us how you've looked at the microstructure? Um, yeah, so I use um, SEM, so scanning electron microscopy. Great. Um, it's just like a big, powerful microscope. But instead of using light, it uses electrons. And you can see like right down to like the micro scale. And sometimes, um, you get, like one day my scale bar said nanometers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> too small. <laughs> but it's really cool. And it's kind of like a satisfying process as well. Because when you um, like use the SEM, you have to start your like your sample prep. I know you'll probably talk about that in another episode. But you kind of start with this scratchy 
horrible looking material and in the end you've prepped it and you've got this lovely mirror surface but you don't really see anything and then you put it into the microscope and you can see all your different like your microstructure has like your grain boundaries your precipitates and they can come in like different shapes and sizes and for like mine I have a lot of precipitates like gamma prime and sometimes like I'll try to find funny looking ones I've seen really odd shapes like (laughs) mushroom ghosts like oh, they make like, really pretty patterns oh, hearts and, and everything cloud watching really isn't it yeah, yeah. yes yeah yeah <laughs> like what shape it is I yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> and um so looking at your say your precipitates the morphology so the shape of them can tell you more about the like macro properties what your maybe your tensile or mechanical behavior would be like and it's quite cool that way because you real life you'll, like, just with your eyes you see nothing but with these like microscopes you can just see like, everything and it's just pretty cool that way we've not actually talked about sample preparation at all. Yeah. so if you want to talk oh, okay. about like you know the the the, the, the process pain. the pain the pain and, and suffering pain. <laughs> <laughs> um so we, like for in my case i have like um samples that were they were gas atomized they were hipped and they're kind of in like little you describe it as like cigar shapes like little like cylinders and you just kind of slice them so you use like um, a sectioning um, device like a sec at home and you kind of mount it in this like um, black like it's called bakelite so it's like a resin or yeah polymer yeah. based yeah resin. and um so that's conductive so it helps with your sam you need a conductive sample for the electrons to pass through and then you grind and polish it so you have like a it's like a spinning disc with different types of grip paper so you start with really coarse and then you finish with really fine and then you have like polishing pads as well so you just want a really nice smooth surface so it's like if you're into diy and uh you've got maybe you want to paint like a piece of wood or your wall you want to like sand it down so it's nice and smooth that way so it's kind of similar that's yeah. great yeah, yeah 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 so how long will it take normally to prep a sample to look under one of these fancy microscopes on a good day um <laughs> you could <can> probably <laughs> um i love the implication that it's very the sad, the it's very seldom a good day it's yeah like, <laughs> on a good day you could probably do it maybe like i think the whole grinding and polishing i can i've got that down to maybe like an hour your sectioning can be a bit longer because um, it's depending on the size of your sample, like I find it quite difficult. And if your sample's really hard, I've had a couple of samples where like blades have broken on me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think on a good day, you probably get it done between two and three hours. So in theory, you could have your preparation and your SEM session all in one day. Mm-hmm. And as you say, we're, we're, we're trying to get down to this like mirror finish, and mm. then you say you put it put it under the microscope, uh, under the microscope, and hopefully it, it then reveals the structure. But also going back to the talk about like you know uh, ideally and everything, sometimes you put it under and you can see big scratches in I your know. surface, and you think heartbreaking. No, I've got to go back. I've got to do it all again. <laughs> I know, and you're just searching for like a, a nice little region, even a little That's small piece. There. Yeah, <laughs> there's no scratches. Ignore there. those big scratches in the material. <laughs> It'll all be fine, but but I think with the with the microscopy, microscopes are something that often people have have looked at at school. And actually, coming back to something that, that you were saying previously, Kathy, about the um, like the macroscopic length scale and things we use to look at at the macroscopic, often optical microscopy will sort of help us bridge that gap of length scale. We can use optical microscopes like just like a lens to look at something that's on the millimeter scale or centimeter scale something like that and then the optical microscopes we can go down to a certain point and then we have to go over to these SEMs these scanning electron microscopes where we get down to the sort of next level and we've sort of increased our our our, our power and our resolution and the 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 length scale over over which we can work that's great so you mentioned optical microscopes mm. and now the electron microscopes mm-hmm. that allow us to go into greater resolution. What is it about electrons that lets us look at microstructures compared to light? So there are inherent uh, resolution limits that are put on some of the techniques that we use. So, for example, there's um, there's an equation that you can write where there's a limit to the, the feature that you can look at using certain types of waves, so optical light, for example. With electrons, as the electrons coming down and bombarding uh, onto the sample, they're scattered from the sample, and we're looking at that scattering. So it's to do with the electron interaction with the matter in the sample that allows us to look at um, what's going on. And actually, with the SEM, there are different 
different ways and different modes we can operate in which allow us to see slightly different things. So, for example, you can use it in one mode which allows you to see the sort of more to do with the sort of surface roughness uh, that looks at the sort of scattering of electrons and the, the, uh, the uh, electrons will pick up more where you've got sort of trenches or valleys in the material. Right, like so a map. Can, like a map, exactly. So you can see that, that sort of feature. Or you can look at slightly different scattering from the electrons in the material and then look at something that's more uh, element specific, where it depends more on what elements you have in the material, how strongly scattering uh, or otherwise it is. So in fact, with a lot of these techniques, it's not just necessarily, if we put it in the, in the microscope, even with, with one technique like that, we can get lots of different information uh, out of the material. And in fact, what, while we're in there, we might as well talk about uh, EDX um, at the same time. X-rays well. always come back. I was going to say, <laughs> X-rays always come back. So EDX, or did, did you learn this as EDX, Fran, or did you learn this as EDS? EDX. EDX, yeah. okay. It seems to be whether you're a chemist or a, a material scientist, which you learned it as, but it's energy dispersive uh, X-ray spectroscopy. So sometimes people emphasize the X and it's EDX. Sometimes people emphasize the S and it's the uh, spectroscopy. Anyway, um, <laughs> Basically, the idea is as my uh, electrons hit uh, the atoms um, that I have in my sample, it causes what are called electronic transitions within the material. So the electrons in the atom basically jump, um, jump around. And as they do, energy is emitted. And that energy is emitted in the form of light, and it's emitted as an X-ray. <laughs> and it turns out that the X-rays that are emitted are so-called characteristic of the particular element that you have within the material. So what this means is if we're bombarding our material with uh, electrons, not only do we get the electrons scattered, which we can then use to create an image, we can also get these X-rays coming off, which we can measure, and use that to tell us information about what atoms are in that particular material. So it can therefore allow us to get a map across the surface and look at the what uh, where where the elements are within the material. So we talked earlier about uh, you know we're looking at these sort of uh, these crystals and we I sort of gave this analogy of of Lego blocks or something. So let's imagine for a second that I'm making a, a, an object out of two types of Lego blocks, small like cubes and then some very long bars. Now, it might be that certain elements would prefer to sit in the long, thin Lego blocks than in the small cubes. And where the elements sit and which of these like crystal structures, which of these phases, as we call them, the elements partition to, are going to change the, the properties of those individual phases and therefore change the properties of the, 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 the material overall. So we can use this EDX to get like a map of our material and see the elements and see where they're sort of distributed. And I think, Fran, you've done quite a bit of this with some of your... You mentioned earlier that you were looking at superalloys, and I think mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, gamma prime. Yes. But perhaps you could explain a bit about like the, the, the two phases in superalloys and, and EDX. <laughs> yeah, so um, in nickel superalloys, you kind of have your um, matrix, so that's called gamma. And inside that, you would have your uh, gamma prime precipitates. So gamma prime would be uh, mostly like nickel, aluminium, titanium, tantalum. So it's like raisins in a cake. I it is, think, yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> for chocolate chips and a cookie. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and um, much more delicious. Isn't it? <laughs> you can um, use EDX, and so say you could have like your aluminium map, and it will show you where all your aluminium would sit in your aluminium. So you will see like bright spots where it would link back up to your gamma prime. Um, and it's chocolate chips. Yeah, yep. your chocolate chips. Love and, this analogy. Um, it's quite. I find it such a cool technique because I use it with my oxidation samples. Mm. So like oxidation is really important with um, like aerospace components. With my um, samples, you get like an oxide layer. So with EDX, you can see what's in that oxide layer, and then you can see that maybe around where your oxide scale forms, some of your uh, raisins or your chocolate chips will start to disappear because mm. you've got diffusion so it's really cool you can like characterize like how well or how badly your sample will oxidize yeah so it's quite a cool yeah i think that's yeah. a really nice example because it it highlights the power of characterization yeah. in terms of where 
you know, the materials properties of that surface will have changed and the materials properties of the, uh, of the overall material because, you know, uh, elements are leaching mm-hmm. out um, to go into this surface layer yeah. of oxide that's that's been formed. So having that sort of understanding of, you know, um, exactly where elements are, what the structures are within the material mm-hmm. and that sort of hierarchy it's just a really lovely example of uh, uh, of how characterization can can be used to understand um, those properties and also to kind of back up any other testing results. Yes. So I did with my oxidation, I did thermal gravimetric analysis. We so just put your sample on a scale and uh, heat it up to really high temperatures, and you can see how it oxidizes. You get your like, oxidation constants, but you might say, "Oh, that alloy worked really well because mm. it didn't oxidize as much." And you might think it's really good, and then you look at it in the SEM, and you go, "Oh God, there's these things are starting to happen. That maybe if I heat it up for even longer, it wouldn't uh, perform as well." Yeah. yeah. And this, this, I think, goes both ways because in the next episode, we're going to be talking about uh, sample testing, yeah. um, as you say, and often we're going to link it to the properties. Yeah. But actually looking back as well, some of the things that we talked about, Cathy, back in like the first episode and things, talking about like phase prediction and uh, understanding what phases might be in our material. If we've done that prediction, we may then, we need to check that it's right. We need to see that the, what is there is what we expected and understand, you know, okay, if I have these two phases, how do they go together? And and going back to the chocolate chip analogy, (laughs) you know, if you're making chocolate chip cookies, you might say to yourself, do I want like little tiny chocolate chunks or do I want, you know, big, big, massive chunks of chocolate? chocolate bar. So (laughs) half chocolate bar, yeah. And depending on what you're making the cookies for, you might want one, you might want the other. And the same is true for the materials. We need to understand that and understand which one we have. And then if we can begin to affect it by doing heat treatments by working the material again in a previous episode we talked about thermomechanical processing all of these things that can begin to affect it and it's only with characterization that we can understand exactly what's going on and again going back back in history you know we've understood for thousands of years that if you take like a metal and hammer it, it changes the properties. If you take an iron and put it in the fire, it changes the properties. You know, blacksmiths have have understood this uh, sort of empirically in this sort of trial and error way for thousands and thousands of years. But actually, it's only with characterization that we can look at what's going in going on in the material and actually understand why that makes a difference why it is that heat treating it makes a difference why it is that hammering changes the structures and therefore changes the properties of the material so which is why i get so excited about characterization Mm -hmm. because it allows us to explain what's going on and link everything together completely and particularly with the blacksmith thing it's been actually fairly recently that we've started to understand why all of those structures and why those effects take place yeah. uh, with the advent of some of these microscopy and characterization techniques that you've been talking about today. Um, so that actually leads quite nicely to the next uh, scale. So we've talked about the macro and the micro, but how do we start bridging between the micro, the nano and the atomic? Is there another microscopy technique that allows us to do that? Yeah. So now we're going right down <laughs> to the the atomic technique. And so we're now looking at another type of microscopy. And this tends to be, um, uh, it, it's what's called transmission electron microscopy or uh, TEM. So again, we're accelerating electrons and our electrons bombard our material but this time in fact we let the uh, or the electrons go through the material so generally we have to create a very thin sample in order to make sure that the electrons can can get through and we look at the pattern that comes out of the other side of the material and the electrons go through the material and as they go through the material they scatter and then we use a series of magnetic lenses which sort of recombine the electrons in order to create an image which we can then see on a screen. And in the old days, this was done with like a phosphorescent screen. So you'd have like a green screen that would like light up as electrons hit it. Now, very often we have a a, a camera or some sort of um, electronic detector, which allows us to create a a, a digital image. But you can still take, you know, uh, good old fashioned like photographs of these things on on some. Yeah, we had a dark room when I was doing my PhD to actually develop film, which was a a fun experience. Yeah. 
And if you look at old PhD theses, you'll see photos just stuck in yeah. uh, on pages. Reams um, and reams yes. of uh, <laughs> for a sensitive film. It's but, great fun. But this really allows us to go down to that that very, very small scale. And actually, increasingly, we, these instruments are getting just more and more powerful. And the resolution that we can get is coming down, down and down. And there were various historically technological holdups. So things like the magnetic lenses that we use were often uh, a challenge for the focusing of these electrons and the creating an image. But as technology has advanced, we can actually begin to create more powerful magnetic lenses, different lens setups that better focus those things, get rid of aberrations, as they're called, which are imperfections in the sort of um, the, the image, and create something. So now, in fact, if you look up TEM images, and we can probably put some of these in the show notes as well, you can actually see sometimes the individual columns of atoms, because you're sort of looking down flat at the material. So you don't necessarily see one atom, you see the sort of column of atoms um, that's sitting there in the material. And that's, I mean, it's its really cool. Like, I can't, I can't deny it. It's just really cool because you can see how the atoms all sit together and sit next to each other. You can see the sort of individual um, arrangements. And importantly for us as uh, metallurgists as well, see imperfections in how the atoms go together. Because very often those imperfections in how the atoms mm. stack together are often control the, the material's properties. And this is where I need to be careful because <laughs> I'm about to get into what's called dislocation theory, which is probably not where we want to go and something that Cathy knows far more about than I do. So um, so I think you it's, teach... It's, it's how we scare all of our second year I was students. going to say you teach the second year's dislocation theory, I do you? indeed, you do. Yes. yes. yeah. Deformation of metals. Why blacksmiths do what they do yep. is really uh, where dislocations are in. But we're not going to go into yep. that. We can, <laughs> if people are interested, come and talk to us. Yes. We'll yeah. happily bore you for hours and end. But that's really cool. Looking at atomic columns through a microscope is really fascinating. And I think, Fran, you, you've not necessarily used TM, uh, transmission electron microscopy, but you've used a related technique to look at your own atoms, atom probe tomography. Mm, yeah. Do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so with atom probe tomography, you take like a tiny uh, little part of your sample. So you make like a little needle. It's maybe about 60 nanometers in length. It's so tiny. And um, inside that needle, you're going to have like your parts of your chocolate chips in it. And it's a type of, I think, spectroscopy where you kind of evaporate your sample and collect the individual atoms. And you can have this 3D reconstruction of your sample. So in my case, our friends in Norway helped us with this. And I have these reconstructions of my needles and I can see the chocolate chips, but I can also see the compositions of them and how they maybe vary between my different samples. And with that, you can say like, oh, what part of your cookie does your certain elements prefer? So does one part of your cookie prefer the chocolate chips or does it prefer going into like the matrix, like mm. the cookie itself? And it's quite cool that way to see the, the effects of the different elements. So you break down your, your little needle atom by atom yep. and you can trace it back. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it really creates cool. the most beautiful images. Yeah. I mean, when, when you see the videos of these things at a conference, you're always going, oh, that's so lovely. You just, <laughs> they, they always have the nicest And they're images. just rotating. As in, oh, these beautiful, beautiful. Again, we'll try and put a link in the show notes uh, of, of, of one of these uh, atom probe needles rotating where you can see all the atoms inside it. They're, they're, they're beautiful. So. So as you can probably tell, as material scientists, we really like looking at things mm. in different mm. ways. But uh, we've sort of we've got this big elephant in the room that's called X-rays or diffraction that we've been putting off for a little bit. <laughs> so I think it's time to unleash Lewis. I was going to say I, I've been contained so far. I mean, I contained well. Contained. I've no been longer. pretty excited, but now I'm going to get really <laughs> excited. So but, can you yes. tell us about? x-rays and neutrons um, and how their scattering tells us more about materials. Sure. So I work most of my time on a technique that we referred to earlier as diffraction. And diffraction is something that you might have come across at school. And I assume, Fran, in the you probably did quite a lot on diffraction at uh, university in physics. Yeah, Bragg's Law, anything yeah. like that. But I think in, in physics, you tend to approach it more from you're interested in the 
sort of the optics theory rather than what it can tell us about the material. Is that right? Or Yeah, like if I think back to my notes, it was a lot of the theory, all mm. the mathematics of it, but it didn't really touch on maybe what that would look like in real life yeah. at maybe like synchrotrons or anything like that yeah. or what really, the like we had like images of the peaks, the diffraction peaks, but nothing really about how they link to maybe the microstructure or anything like that. Yeah. It was just really... The yeah, the yeah. So yeah, so in diffraction, what happens is basically diffraction is a property of a wave where if you have a wave that goes through a little gap, the wave on the other side of it will spread out. And you might have seen this if you've ever seen like a water wave um, at, at a beach or something going through a narrow gap. As it comes out of the other side of the gap, it sort of spreads out. But actually, if you then have two gaps the waves come out of both of the gaps and they start to what's called interfere with each other. You've got one wave, again, if you imagine a water wave coming along, if a water wave meets another water wave, those waves are going to hit each other and it's going to create like a big plume. And so we get this what's called interference pattern produced um, on the other side. What people realised with diffraction and these, uh, these slit experiments, as they're called, was that basically if you can look at the pattern of waves that's produced, you can work out the spacing that the waves originally went through. Now, why is this useful for us as material scientists? Because we're thinking about water waves and things like that. Well, actually, it turns out this is a property of all waves, so any wave you can do this with. And you can therefore do the same thing with x-rays. And rather than it going through a slit, what we find is that individual atoms in your material act like that slit and scatter the waves in this way. Now, what that means is that if we can scatter the x-rays off the atoms in our structure and create one of these patterns, the so-called diffraction pattern, you can therefore calculate where the atoms were that created that pattern. So it allows us to work out exactly where our atoms are located within our structure. And so this is incredibly powerful because it allows us, as we say, to go right down to that atomic scale. So we take our object, we shine some sort of wave, very often x-rays, through the material. It creates a pattern which we measure on the screen. And then from that pattern, we can understand the structure of the underlying material. And I just think it's it's magic uh, and like wizardry. And as I say, generally, very often what we use is uh, we're using x-rays because uh, you have to basically, it depends, the, the spacings that you're looking at have to be a similar size to the wavelength of your material. And that basically means that for uh, light, we have to use x-rays, the x-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum in order to probe our materials, in order to understand what's going on on the atomic scale. But you can also use other things. So you can use, we mentioned uh, neutrons uh, as well. So neutrons are actually a, a subatomic particle, but actually due to what's called wave particle duality <laughs> in quantum physics. So you can see again, we're bringing in physics, we're bringing in chemistry, we're bringing everything uh, into play here. So due to wave particle duality, actually when our particles are moving very, very quickly, we can think of them as a wave. And it turns out that very fast-moving neutrons act as a wave in this way, and so we can scatter our neutrons and similarly create a pattern. And then from that pattern, work out what was going on in the structure. Now, you might be thinking, well, why would we do it with x-rays or neutrons? Why have we got two choices here? And it's to do with basically how they interact. So we talked earlier about like, you know, going back to our discussion of a CT scan and we said that a different uh, X-ray will be absorbed a certain uh, amount by a, a certain uh, element. When it comes to scattering and the X-ray bouncing off elements, again, X-rays will bounce off elements in a slightly different way. And so we can use this in order to, as I say, locate not only where the atoms are, but what atoms are at what particular locations. However, certain elements are going to scatter X-rays in a similar way, and so it's going to be very difficult to tell them apart. Or something like hydrogen doesn't really scatter X-rays like at all. It, it, it scatters X-rays very, very weakly. 
And so we can't really see hydrogen. Hydrogen is so important for, you know, biological systems, understanding what are called hydrogen bonds. Uh, these really control the way, particularly like uh, organic molecules, things going on in our body really interact. So understanding where hydrogens are is incredibly, incredibly important. So what we do is we, we change our x-rays for neutrons instead. And it turns out that neutrons scatter off different atoms in a slightly different way. Elements that you might not be able to tell apart with x-rays, you might now be able to tell apart with neutrons. And so what we can do is we can now begin to, to you know, use these techniques in order to understand exactly where those atoms are placed and identify those atoms and how they go together in the structure and therefore understand the properties. And this entire field is what's called uh, crystallography. And I knew I was going to talk about crystallography. <laughs> it was coming at some point. Uh, but crystallography. So crystallography is the study of these sort of atomic structures and how those atomic stacked structures are, are formed and the properties that they give uh, the material. So a crystal is anything where we've got this repeated structure in the material. In fact, the definition of a crystal is slightly more complicated than that, but our very basic uh, simplistic definition of a crystal that we're going to use for now is going to be that we've got this sort of repeated uh, structure of atoms. So imagine just lining atoms up in a row. It's like stacking oranges or balls or something. Uh, they form these nice regular, regular structures um, in our material. And so crystallography is where we're trying to understand these things and these structures together. And we can do these studies, these diffraction studies and these crystallographic studies, not just on metals and materials we can do it on on, on any material we like so uh, there's a huge field of protein crystallography where people are looking at understanding the positions of atoms in individual proteins because based on where the atoms are in those proteins control the functionality of the protein and so if we can begin again to understand where the atoms are in that functionality, we can then potentially begin to understand how to control it. So create, you know, better drugs or something that might better control or attack disease uh, and things. So we have this in metals, in biology, there's physical crystallography, chemical crystallography, uh, biological crystallography, all of these, these, these different things. So it's, uh, and this is, this is where I tend to sit. I'm part of the British Crystallographic Association. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, about these crystal structures and, and and what's going on and using high energy X-rays and neutrons in order to to probe these structures and work out where the atoms are, are, are sitting and how that controls the properties. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. If I sort of digress a little bit, you brought up the British Crystallographic Association. Britain has a huge sort of demographics and a lot of understanding of crystallography. Some of the most famous crystallographers have been British and in fact women. So yes. I wondered if you can tell us a couple of examples. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, the, the the history of crystallography is a completely, uh, it is utterly fascinating and I thoroughly recommend anyone to look at it. Interestingly, as a field, I believe it still has the highest number of Nobel Prizes uh, within it uh, as a field. And it was originally started in the early 1900s by a father and a son, uh, the Braggs, William Henry Bragg and William Lawrence Bragg, who did the first calculations and the first proof of uh, crystallography. But as you say, since then, through the years, it's been picked up by a number of people. So a couple of people uh, to, to highlight, people like uh, Kathleen Lonsdale, who was the uh, first uh, female fellow of the Royal Society. And one of the other most famous crystallographers that people have probably heard of is Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin, who famously took photo 51, which is a diffraction pattern from which they were able to determine that DNA has this double helix structure that we have that underlies most of our understanding of sort of, you know, proteins and um, the way things work in the body. And the person who I, who I really want to talk about, uh, one of my personal heroes, is Dorothy Hodgkin. So Dorothy Hodgkin was a Nobel Prize winning scientist, and she worked in the field of protein uh, crystallography mainly. And over the course of an extremely impressive career, she discovered a, a number of different things. So one of the earliest pieces of work that she did was actually looking at the structure of penicillin. So penicillin had been discovered by Alexander Fleming and had revolutionized the field of uh, antibiotics. 
But of course, if we want to make new antibiotics, we need to understand exactly the structure of those and the functionality of it in order that we can then create new chemicals that work on this mechanism or have enhanced mechanisms. So again, we need to understand exactly where the atoms in this are placed. And so Dorothy Hodgkin did some work and she demonstrated the crystal structure and worked out where the atoms in palacinin were located and, and what the, uh, the molecular structure of that was. Now, for, for most people, that, that would probably be enough. <laughs> but in fact, she went on to, to discover the crystal structures of uh, another couple of things as well. Vitamin B12, which is what uh, I believe she won the Nobel Prize for, and also insulin. She worked out the structure of uh, insulin, which again was incredibly important for our understanding of you know, health, uh, diabetes, and, uh, and all of these sorts of things. She's an incredibly impressive uh, human being. And a few years ago, there was um, a lot of interest in putting a British British scientist on the new 50 pound note and uh, one of the people who was suggested was Dorothy Hodgkin because of the work she did that is so just phenomenally fantastic and one of the things that actually you know we probably don't have time to go into but a lot of the analysis that we do um, on these materials is now done by computational methods and require like um, uh, advanced computational methods in order to help us work out exactly what's going on uh, within these materials but Dorothy Hodgkin was doing most of this work by hand with pencil and paper and I think it took her something like 15 years to work out what the structure of insulin working on the same problem by hand to work out these things it's absolutely incredible and if you ever see one of these structures of insulin and uh, vitamin B12 if you go to Google and have a look for Dorothy Hodgkin there's a wonderful photo of her where she's sitting um, uh, next to the three structures the, these three famous structures that she solved vitamin B12 insulin and penicillin and look at the size of those structures the number of atoms in those structures and just be impressed at, uh, at the work she did it, it it's phenomenal <laughs> amazing amazing so if we bring it back to metals then. yes yes sorry much simpler <laughs> structures no no no, no don't apologize we love learning about <laughs> british crystallographers and championing the women um that have come before us as well um but I would like to bring it back a little bit to metals yep. and, uh, and talk a little bit about how we go about using some of these methods um, in what we call in situ experiments yeah. that are much more relevant to industry. So could you talk to us a little bit about them? Yeah, so Fran mentioned uh, in situ measurements earlier, and this is, again, one of the uh, the, the really amazing things um, about what we do. Because if we think about our material and the material's properties, as we said, we need to understand these structures and and their properties but let's imagine we've got a metal that's going in an, an aircraft or something it's going to be experiencing certain conditions while it's there it's going to get very hot it's going to be put under a huge amount of force so it would be useful if we could not only understand what the structures are at room temperature when we've got a chunk of this metal sitting on the table but also to understand it if it's under the conditions it will experience during operation. So this leads us to what we call in situ experiments, where basically what we're going to do is we're going to put it, the material, in the environment that it would be in or that we want to test it in, and then shine x-rays or neutrons through it while we're in that environment to work out what happens to that material uh, in those conditions. So we talked earlier uh, about some of the materials Fran's been looking at, these, uh, these super alloys where we've got these, these two phases. And as we say, these super alloys are used in turbine engines. And what we can therefore do is we can take these and we can mimic the conditions that we would have in that turbine engine. So we can take the material and, for example, put it under a, a huge amount of force. And we can see what's going on within the material as we put it under that force. And that's, I think, the experiment that you had, Fran, where you, yeah. we've got these materials and we've applied a, a force to these materials. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at it. So perhaps you can tell us a bit more about the, the type of data you've been looking at. This yeah. experiment. So I've been looking at load partitioning data. So you can think about it as um, your cookie and your chocolate chips. It's how they both behave as your stress, or your force increases at different temperatures. So you kind of start off with your diffraction peak with the chocolate chip and the cookie or gamma and gamma prime. Their peaks overlap. And um, as you heat them up and you pull them apart, these peaks start to separate. 
and you can have this nice like waterfall diagram of how your peaks will change as a function of stress and we can look at the mechanical properties then of each phase and how that maybe varies at different regions in your alloy like the different grains as well and it's quite a cool technique because again exactly yeah. like a, 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 a this chocolate chip analogy is a gift that keeps on giving <laughs> honestly because again if you take a chocolate chip uh, yeah. cookie and pull it apart mm-hmm. assuming it's a nice soft cookie yeah. like generally what will happen is the the, the cookie dough breaks rather than than the chocolate yeah. chip right and so it's it's the dough that's therefore sort of distorting and the same thing is often true with mm-hmm. these super alloys is we're interested in which bit is going to break first is it yeah. going to be the the, the 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 chocolate chips the gamma prime or is it going to be the the gamma matrix the 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 that deforms first mm-hmm. and so we can look at these things and and actually so when we do these experiments they're the conditions that we can use are wild and varied. So we've just talked about like putting things under stress. We can do things at high temperature. We can cool things down to like mm-hmm. near absolute zero to really, really cold temperatures, like 200 degrees below, you know, freezing. Uh, we can apply magnetic fields. We can do uh, reactions where we've got, you know, a new chemical being introduced into the system uh, and see what happens and monitor the structure and how it's changing through all these things. So the the range of experiments that we can do is is so vast and varied to provide us with this understanding of of how the material works, how it forms and changes. And very often when we're doing these experiments, we might do some of them, uh, as we call, in the house. So this is where we do them, like in the university itself. Or we use UK national facilities or international facilities in order to do this. So, and these facilities are are particle accelerator facilities very often. And normally when I say the word particle accelerator, people are thinking of something like CERN. So CERN is a particle accelerator where what they do is they accelerate the particles round and round really quickly and then they smash them together and then they look at the mess of things that comes out from that collision. We actually use particle accelerators slightly differently. Either what we do is we accelerate the particles very, very quickly And as they're accelerating round and round, they actually give out energy and they give out energy as very high energy x-rays. And we can then use those high energy x-rays to look at the material. Or what we do is we accelerate those particles very, very quickly, smash them into something like the way some works. But then what we do is we use the particles that are given out by that collision in order to then study the materials. So what we do at what's called a spallation source is we accelerate uh, particles very, very quickly, they smash into a target, and that gives out these high-energy neutrons, which, as we say, we can then bombard into our material and use that to then create one of these diffraction patterns and actually understand what's, what's going on. And that's actually what I do a lot of work in. So I actually work very closely with the diamond light source and the Isis neutron and muon source, as they're called. So these are two facilities in Oxfordshire where we uh, create these very high energy x-rays and neutrons and use them to understand the the properties of the material and the properties of the material as they undergo deformation or are in a particular environment that, that we might want to study them in. That's great. That's super interesting and gives us so much to work with. As, a, as an alloy developer, I, I enjoy having as much information as possible from the simplest experiments. So that really helps. But also cues us up to talk a little bit about your work just to wrap up this episode, Lewis. So you mentioned you work a lot with these facilities, these particle accelerators. But what exactly is it that you're looking for and what is it that your group are studying more generally? So I work on a, a very specific type of diffraction technique. Uh, I work on a technique that's called total scattering, uh, as it's called. And this is an advanced type of scattering technique where we take all of the x-rays or neutrons from the material and interpret uh, what they mean to give us an understanding of what's going on on the atomic scale. But really specifically what it does is it gives us a view of the material as if we're sitting on an individual atom within the material. So you can imagine yourself sitting on an individual atom on that 10 to the minus 10 scale and looking at what's going on around you um, in the material. And what that does is it changes our perspective of, of, of the material. So the analogy that I often like to give is I often like to think about like planes in flight. So if you've ever seen an aerial display of like planes going across the across the sky, 
normal diffraction is as if we're sitting on the ground and watching the, the pattern that the planes make across the sky. With the type of technique that I do, it puts us in the cockpit of one of those planes. And so it gives us access to a slightly different type of information than the material. So you can imagine in this analogy, if I'm now sitting in the cockpit of my plane, I can look to the left and I can see, oh, it's Susan in the plane to the, to the left uh, of me. And then I look to the right and go, oh, and Ian's over there to the right in the plane uh, on the other side. So it changes. It gives me a different level of information in the structure. And it might be that our atoms are liking to uh, are, are doing uh, something like that as well. It might be that what the atoms are doing are going, actually, maybe I'd like to sit next to a certain type of atom. So a good analogy for this is actually uh, if you think about uh, school children in assembly. School children in assembly will form nice, neat lines uh, because they've been told to by the teachers. You know, they've been sort of marshaled into those, those lines, which is exactly like our crystal structure in the material. But individually, it might be that, you know, every, every child has their best friends and they probably want to sit next to their best friends. And so they individually will arrange themselves so they're, they're sitting in the little groups they want to sit in, even though overall they're still sitting in those nice um, ordered lines. And so there's this other level of information within the material that, again, will affect the properties that we need to understand. And that's what myself and my group are working on. We're working on looking at this technique, looking at that information, and continuing to develop those techniques to give us more understanding of what's going on uh, on those length scales. Amazing, amazing. So with that, I think we've kind of learned a lot about characterization. We've linked all the way from the atomic skill and how individual atoms are bonded together, how they're arranged in different configurations up to the microstructure and eventually making up our, our particular object to the micro scale. So with that, I'd like to very much thank our guests for today and go to Fran first. Fran, are there any last thoughts you wanted to share with us today? Yeah, so I think as a PhD student, um, characterization is a really great topic. There's so many different experiments you can do and you have like plenty of variety within your work. That's incredible, yes. And I completely agree with that and very much encourage it as your supervisor. <laughs> and of course, Lewis, you, you've spoken a lot. Thank you so much about sharing your, your experience and your expertise in characterization. But are there any last thoughts you wanted to deliver us with today? Yeah, well, I think uh, picking up on, on what Fran said, I mean, I, I think my enthusiasm for characterization has probably, has hopefully come through. <laughs> um, but I, I think for me, it's always been how do we understand what, what's going on uh, and what's taking place? You know, can we link that uh, that understanding? And for me, characterization is that that key that that unlocks that we've got a physical property and we need to see what's what's going on with that structure in order to link these two. And so understanding that that link between them and developing new cool techniques that enable us to have that understanding and, 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 and unlock that is is really really at the heart of it for me and I think it's one of the things that that I take great pleasure in is as I say that interdisciplinarity I've always been interested in those bounds between subjects and with characterization as I say you can you can look at metals you can look at biological proteins and and, and everything in between the two so you can really it, it, the, the world is your oyster as to as to what you want to explore and study and I feel I'm always uh, getting to to play and learn more about new materials, new techniques that will provide new and different insight at different length scales and and, and different levels of understanding. For for me, characterization has always been where where my passion is, and hopefully this will inspire a couple of other people to think about it as well. That would be great. We, we can use all the scientists and engineers we can get. Mm -hmm. So with that, let me thank my guest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis, for joining us today and putting yourself in the hot seat for once. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure and, <laughs> and, and a slightly surreal experience as well. <laughs> That's OK. You can get used to it. And of course, thank you to my intrepid co-host and student, Fran. Welcome. <laughs> great. Thank you also to all of our listeners for tuning in. And please do join us next time when our topic will be sample testing. Thank you.
Thanks very much for listening. If you want to join the conversation, you can find us on Instagram at Materials Unlocked. If you want to find out more about the topics that we've covered and the work that we do, a link can be found to our website in the show notes. Our thanks to the Advanced Metallic System CDT, the Henry Royce Institute, and the Department of Material Science at the University of Sheffield. See you next time.